You can't deny the Spectrum Next is certainly an exciting piece of hardware. Whether you're exploring the Spectrum's library of games, checking out the latest releases, taking full advantage of its new capabilities, or perhaps dusting off those old programming books and having fun writing code again, it's a machine which has certainly sparked a lot of joy of late. But of all its capabilities, there's one which has been a little underexplored thus far. The ability to load in alternate cores, allowing your Next to temporarily become another console, computer, or even an arcade machine. Particularly from the more experimental nature of this facility, getting started with it can be a bit obtuse or a little confusing. It also doesn't help that all the details to do it are spread across a myriad of sources. So in this video, I'm going to explore a few of the available cores out there, covering what you need to do to get them up and running, and showing off some of the games available and how they perform. Of course, it's worth noting, this is all how things stand in September 2020, and things may have changed quite a lot, depending on when you are watching this video. Before you can get started with tinkering with your next, there's a few things you'll need to dig up or have handy in order to take advantage of this feature. First up is a PS2 keyboard. This might sound a bit strange, but depending on which of the cores you want to play around with, the next membrane keyboard may not have enough keys to let you use them properly. This is really more of a concern for those who are interested in the computer cores. So if you're not really interested in those, then this is probably no real problem for you. Next up is having a spare SD card handy, particularly one which is under four gig in size, as some of the cores at the moment require your card to be formatted with the older FAT16 file system in order for them to load files correctly. So depending on how you have your main card set up on your next, you may prefer to simply just set up a second card for any core that you will want to mess around with. Third are video cables, both RGB and VGA. Though most cores will work with all three of the next output options, HDMI, RGB and VGA, it's worth noting that at the time of writing or recording, a subset do not. If anything, having a VGA monitor will really serve you the best, at least with how things are at the moment. Things obviously will change sooner or later, and hopefully by the time issue two machines come out, hopefully all three options are supported for all cores. And as a bonus, if you're able to connect your next to a monitor which you could rotate 90 degrees, you'll find that you could enjoy some of the cores that much more, as some of the arcade game cores do require a vertical monitor. Now for the process of getting these cores installed onto your next. Before that, however, you'll need to make one configuration change to your next's next ZXOS installation. Insert the card into your modern computer and open up the config.ini file located in the machines slash next directory. Set the value of the PS2 line to zero and save. This is used to tell the next that its PS2 port will have a keyboard or a PS2 keyboard mouse splitter connected. When set back to one, it signifies that only a mouse is connected. For some of the cores, you'll really want to use the PS2 keyboard instead of the next membrane keyboard. So. This is quite handy. With this out of the way, let's talk about the cores themselves. Most of them are found on the repository run by Victor Truco, one of the developers of the underlying TB Blue Tech behind the next. So your first step is to visit that repository, link in the description, and download the appropriate cores you want to check out to your computer. When you've done that, grab your next SD card, and set up the directory for each machine you want to install inside the machines directory. Copy the downloaded core file in and rename it to core.bit. Finally, create a text file, name it core.cfg and fill it out with a single line. Name equals the display name of the machine you want to call it, what you'll see on the, on the cores menu. When you've done this for all the cores you want to set up, pop your SD card back into your next, power it up and hold the C key when prompted. You'll see a list of cores you've got installed, and to add a new one, highlight an empty row using the arrow keys and hit the spacebar. You will then be presented with a list of cores to install. Once again, highlight the one you wish to install and hit return to flash it. When it's done, you're taken back to the cores menu where you could install others or get to loading one that you wish to play around with.
The first car I want to showcase is the BBC Micro. This supports both the classic Model B, but the later enhanced Master 128, which, for my money, is the one I found to work better. In terms of content, this core relies on an MMB image, as used by various SD solutions for real BBC hardware. This needs to be the first file on your SD card, and I found it convenient to set up a separate card rather than mess around with my main next ZXOS card. The image provided on the core's uh, repository gives you a fairly comprehensive catalogue of classic games, presented with an easy-to-browse menu system. When you pick a game, it'll boot up and boom, away you go. As for the general capability, there's no better way to showcase it than by flicking through a bunch of games. Death Star is one which might play a little weird if you're using an external keyboard, which is really recommended, but it's a frantic adaptation of Sinistar, which was renamed when the license fell through. BBC, of course, was where the iconic shooter Thrust originated, and this version is still an amazing game to enjoy. Even though, like Death Star, the key controls might be a little weird when using an external keyboard. Revs is a game which doesn't quite work right on other FPGA implementations of the beat, so it's great that on the next, it works wonders here. It's an important foundational racing simulator, and having it along with the plus five tracks release included is a great surprise. It's a game which does require a bit of practice, but it's an amazing simulator for the time, and it's great the next really lets it run well. You'll also find plenty of new releases included on the disc as well. The most impressive of them being White Light, a vertically scrolling shooter which is sold as the spiritual successor to iconic Beam Shmup Firetrack. It's fast, it's fluid, and it really pushes the hardware well, and it's great to see it running here on the core. Another example of a modern release which I'm impressed with is this neat version of Centipede, one which aims to be very close to the arcade original, and it does a great job of doing it, and is great fun to play as well. It's a really tight conversion, and one that's well worth checking out. But the last rabbit of the hat of this core is that it supports a 6502 second processor. And you might think that's a bit weird, but there is one great use for it. The second processor version of Elite. If you've never played this edition of the game, you're certainly in for a ride. Whilst the original version of Elite was no slouch on a classic Model B, the extra performance of this version in action is mind-blowing, and is well worth checking out for a fresh take on an absolute classic game. Next up, we've got some arcade games for the next. Installing these cores does require some extra steps to prepare the ROMs, though this is mostly automated. However, you will need a Windows environment to run it, which can be a pain if you're not ready for it, which is something I certainly found. Once you've downloaded the cores from Victor's repository, you unzip them and find the necessary ROM images. Those typically come from a non-merged set for MAME. You then run the included batch files to prepare the ROMs to go alongside the core. When they've been built, you'll find there's a convenient directory you can copy over to your next SD card and install them as shown earlier. So for the games themselves. The arcade cores available now tend to coalesce around a few common hardware platforms. The first of these I'll show is the core for Namco's board for Rally X. This supports both the original game and new Rally X and both play very well indeed. These are the only sets of games I know of which use a horizontal layout. From there, the next set of supported games runs on the hardware designed for Pac-Man. There's quite a number of titles included here, with the original Pac-Man being the centerpiece, alongside Ms. Pac-Man, which is there as well. But you'll also find plenty of weird games too. An example of one is Crush Roller. And the final core 
I want to show off is the set of games which run on the hardware for Galaxian. There's quite a number available here with 17 all up. Obviously Galaxian is present, but you'll also get classics like Mooncrester as well, both of which are worth checking out if you're a fan of early simple shooters. Something to note with these last two sets of games, as these were all designed for portrait monitors, you'll need to have your next connected to a display which you could rotate to play them properly. For the purposes of being able to understand what is happening on screen, I've chosen to pre-rotate these images whilst I was recording the footage, rather than having to manually do it when editing later on. So you'll get an idea of how things actually look if you have the right setup for your monitor. Now for some console fun with the iconic Intellivision, a system which certainly doesn't receive the love its rivals do these days. Before we explore a few games on the system, there are two items which you need to be aware of when using this core. Firstly, the core is one of a few which doesn't support HDMI output, meaning your options are only RGB or VGA. Now if you are using RGB, like I am for this footage, the core starts up on VGA, regardless of how you have your next configured, so you'll need to manually switch it over by pressing the NMI button along with the 2 key once the core starts. The second factor is the core only supports loading ROMs off a FAT16 formatted card. So as long as you have a card prepared with your next OS and the ROMs on a smaller card, you should be fine on that front. Game inputs use a mix of both the joystick as well as the keyboard. One limitation is that while the Intellivision's controller offered multiple fire buttons alongside its keypad, the core only reliably works with a standard single button joystick. Depending on which of the games you're playing, this probably isn't too much of an issue. Classics like Astro Smash work great, and the joystick is certainly far more comfortable for a pure Twitch game like this over the console's original controller. The same can also be said for games like Burger Time and Bumper Jump, classic arcade versions which also only rely on a single fire button as well, which means both feel incredibly solid to play, being that you don't really need the extra flexibility the disc offers. If anything, this setup really only becomes a problem for games which do use both buttons, games like Beam Rider or The Dreadnought Factor which are great to enjoy in their original versions, despite needing to reach over to the keyboard in order to use the secondary fire. Can be a bit of a hit and miss scenario, especially because those games can get seriously frantic when you really do need that control. The final core to feature before wrapping things up is the ColecoVision core. Like the Intellivision core, this one will require you to use a FAT16 formatted SD card to run your ROMs. Unlike that core, however, ROM organization here is slightly different. In fact, there's a pack of ROMs available from Victor's repository which you'll need to copy onto your card before using it. As usual, when the core is up and running, you can change games over by pressing the green drive button. This brings a menu which lists the games in that pack. It's not as freeform as you'll get with some of the other cores, but it's nice knowing that what is present on the card is likely going to work well. An important thing to note though is that while the Intellivision core lacks HDMI support, this one lacks RGB support. And whilst the HDMI does work nicely, it doesn't play off my capture equipment, so what you're seeing on screen is a camera filming the output. A feature I genuinely love with this core is that it is compatible with Mega Drive controllers and gives you both action buttons as a result. It makes games like Omega Race play quite well. It may lack the vector graphics of the arcade original, but this one's quite a solid take on the game and having both the fire and thrust buttons on your controller actually feels a little nicer than those original Coleco sticks, in my opinion. Arcade Force in general is where the Coleco vision shine, with many of its great titles being those. And so the hardware really does justice to a lot of them for the era. So you can see with games like Buck Rogers and Centipede and even Time Pilot, they're all pretty solid adaptations of the original arcade games, despite the system's limits for the period.
Though arcade games do make a large chunk of the ColecoVision's library, they're not all of the games featured on there, and you'll find plenty of games which are converted from other consoles or home computers to complement them, which we can see here with the great version of Beam Rider. This one is incredibly fluid to play, and thanks to that gamepad offering dual 5 up support when you're using a Mega Drive pad, it's that bit more convenient to play compared to its Intellivision counterpart as a result. It's a really good version of the game, and you can see it does it more than impressive justice. This is only just the tip of the iceberg of what you can do on your Spectrum next when you load in alternate cores. It may still be relatively early days for the majority of those available, as we can see with the various inconsistencies, items like video support, controller compatibility, and even orientation that we've seen in the cores I've shown. That being said, there is a lot which can happen between the release of this video in September 2020 and the projected delivery of Next from the Issue 2 Kickstarter campaign sometime in 2021. Though there are other cores currently in development, I do hope that there is some attention spent on some of these cores, particularly as with both the ColecoVision and Intellivision cores, the Next is truly a great way to enjoy those systems. Cores for them do exist on other FPGA platforms, but those tend to lack convenient access to the keypads found on their controllers. Along with that, the BBC Microcore is an absolute standout to use, even with the requirement of having to prepare your own separate SD card. My experience with it was incredibly solid, and it's one that absolutely makes for a great reason to consider hooking up a PS2 keyboard to your next. Though the Next capabilities aren't likely to live up to those in other FPGA platforms like Mister, for instance, it's certainly a fantastic feature to have on top of a great modern retro computer, which the Next achieves incredibly well. If this has piqued your interest and you want more information on using cores or some of the other facilities, I will include a bunch of links in the video description. Stuff like where you can get them, of course, but along with the main community page group, which is really where most of the discussion is centred. Which for me, pretty much brings time on this video. If you've enjoyed it, would you kindly give it a thumbs up and possibly let your friends know as well. Word of mouth is an incredibly powerful thing and it means so much to help get these videos in front of new viewers who might enjoy the chilled approach I take. If you haven't already done so, do consider hitting that subscribe button, especially if that chilled approach I'm taking here really inspires you and you really want to enjoy more chilled explorations of interesting games for classic platforms. A shout out as always goes to the channel supporters over on Patreon, the support of whom well and truly makes all this possible. If you like what I do here and you want a means to help support it, you can follow their example and check out the links below. Finally, and most importantly, thank you all very much for taking yet another voyage beyond the scan lines.